To a Mouse by Robert Burns, written in 1785. We slick it, cower and timorous beastie, ah, oh, what a panic's in the breastie. Then he not start away so hasty with bicker and brattle. I'd be lathe to run and chase thee with murder and paddle. I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies an ill opinion which makes you startle at thee, thy poor earthborn companion and fellow mortal. I doubt not wise, but thou my thieve. But then, poor beastie, thou my own leave. Dame and acre and a thrave is a small quest. I get a blessing with the lave and never missed it. Thy wee be the house you two in ruin. See the walls, the winds are strewing, and nothing now to big and noon, fog is green, and bleak December winds and sowing, bay snail and keen. Thou saw the fields lay bare and waste, and weary winter coming face, cozy here beneath the blaze, thou thought it well to crash, the cruel coulter passed out through the cell. That wee bit heap of leaves and stibble has cost thee money a weary nibble. Now thou it turns out for all the trouble, but house or hold, to thou the winter sleety dribble and crouching cold. But mousy, thou art no thy lane, and proving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men gang off to giggly, and lead us not but grief and pain for promised joy. Still, thou art blessed compared with me, the present only touches thee. But our chai backward cast me eye on prospects drear and forward. I cannot see. I guess I'm fair. To a mouse. So, what do you think that's about? So, Robert Burns was Scottish, and I don't know if I have any kind of a good Scottish accent or not. Uh, <laughs> but I certainly have a lot of fun reading it like that. Um, but... I still think, as strange as so much of this is, that you can still figure out some of what's going on in this poem. So just look at it for a brief moment and see if you can come up with any, any ideas, any words that you recognize. Okay, is there anything in here that you think you recognize? Any words, any ideas that might make a little bit of sense to you? If so, uh, go ahead and tell me about that. Now, I'm not going to just leave you there. Let's take a look at a translation here. So, um, here on the right side, we have a, a standard English translation of the original Scottish English. Okay. So the poem reads like this and I'll read it through and then I will talk a little bit about it. Small, sleek, cower and timorous beast. Oh, what a panic is in your breast. You need not start away so hasty with hurrying scamper. I would be loath to run and chase you with murdering plow staff. I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies it ill opinion, which makes thee startle at me thy poor earthborn companion and fellow mortal. I doubt not sometimes, but you may steal. What then, poor beast? You must live. An odd ear in twenty-four sheaves is a small request. I will get a blessing with what is left and never miss it. Your small house, too, in ruin. Its feeble walls the winds are scattering. And nothing now to build a new one, of course, grass green. And bleak December's winds coming, both bitter and keen. You saw the fields laid bare and wasted, and weary winter coming fast, and cozy here beneath the blast you thought to dwell, till crash the cruel plow passed out through your cell. That small bit heap of leaves and stubble has cost you many a weary nibble. Now you are turned out for all your trouble, without a house or holding. 
to endure the winter sleety dribble and hoar frost cold. But mouse, you are not alone in proving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men go often askew and leaves us nothing but grief and pain for promised joy. Still, you are blessed compared with me. The present only touches you, but oh, I backward cast my eye on prospects dreary and forward, though I cannot see, I guess in fear. All right, did that English make a little bit more sense to you? Hopefully you can kind of see some of the similarities there. But Okay, so what do you think this poem is about? Because one of the things we are doing here is just reading a poem. Uh, and so we're doing some poetry analysis. But this will also connect with the novel that we're going to read starting in a, in a day or so. So tell me, what do you think this poem is saying now that we've read it in more normal and regular English? Okay, one of the first things that I notice is that the poem is broken up into what we call stanzas. A N Z A. Stanza. That's an A, kind of. Okay, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six lines in each stanza. And so I want to see, is that pattern accurate? Does it hold up for the whole thing? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. Okay. So each stanza has six lines. And so then one of the other things I want to do is check and see, is there a rhyme scheme? Now, the translation, I think, tries to do a good job with it. But if we look at the original, we'll get a little bit better. Um, so beastie is the first line and the first Rhyme is going to get the letter A. Beasty, breasty, hasty, the. So we have an A, 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 and then skip slime. Brattle, it's going to be B because you go A to B. Paddle, B. A, 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 B, A, B. Rhyme scheme. Let's see if it holds up. Dominion, union, opinion. A, A, a companion a startle b b so yes it looks like this poem follows a pretty strict pattern of three lines that rhyme a a a b a b and so that's how we would discuss the rhyme pattern in this particular poem so we'd say it has an A-A-A-B-A-B -A -A -B rhyme pattern. So six stanzas with a rhyme scheme, a rhyme pattern. All right, but now let's talk about what it means. All right, so the poem is called To a Mouse. Now, who speaks to a mouse? Do you know anyone who speaks to a mouse? Usually we all scream and jump on a chair and we cry for our wives to come and save us. I understand, okay? Uh, but if you read the context, where do you think they are? They talk about uh, sheaves of corn. They talk about the plow staff and the field. So it makes sense that it might be a farmer speaking to a mouse. And so now in my mind, I'm imagining a, a tall farmer standing in his field looking down at this teeny tiny little mouse. So we have a farmer talking to a mouse, right? Unless it's titled to a mouse. All right, so what's being saying? Small, sleek, cowering, timorous beast, what a panic is in your breast. You need not start away so hasty with hurrying scamper. I would be loath to run and chase you. So what he says here in this first stanza is, oh, dear mouse, I'm so sorry I startled you. Your panic in your breast, your heart is pumping hard. I, I didn't mean to scare you. Don't run away. I would be 
hated. I would hate myself. I would be loath. It'd be a terrible thing if I chased after you and tried to kill you with my my plow staff here, my, my, my sharp stick. So don't worry. I'm not going to try and hurt you. And then the farmer continues and says, I'm truly sorry that man's dominion has broken nature's social union. Which is a beautiful line. And what he's saying is that man's dominion over the earth, over all creation, over all animals, over the land. And I'm sorry that man's power over this earth has broken the social union, the social agreement with nature, making man and animal scared of each other. So this farmer says, look, I am sorry we cannot have a relationship. I'm sorry that our world is broken and that you are scared of me. He says, I understand why you're scared of me. I understand why you are startled. But then he says, my poor earthborn companion and fellow mortal. He says, we are in this together. Your situation and my situation are similar. We are tied together. Even though we are scared of each other, you are scared of me. And even though we can't have this relationship, we are still joined together on this earth. That's great. I love it. Okay. He says, I doubt not that you may steal from me. What then, poor beast? You must live. An odd ear, ear, not ear here, but an ear of corn in 24 sheaves is a small request. 24 sheaves, we're talking about 24 big bundles of corn. And the mouse takes one little bit. He says, I know you steal from me, but you know what, mouse? You have to live, and so you steal the ear of corn. It's a small request that you make of me. I don't mind. I have a blessing with what is left. I never miss what you take. You are welcome to take my corn. Let's live in harmony. All right. That's pretty nice too. But now we start getting to more of the main point here. Okay. Your small house too in ruin. It's feeble walls. The winds are scattering and nothing now to build a new one. Of course, grass green. And bleak December's winds coming. So the mouse in this farmer's field built a little burrow dug a little hole, pulled some grass over, some leaves, built this nice little burrow for the mouse to live in. And now it's, it's destroyed. And the winds are blowing the leaves and the grass all over. And now that it's December coming, there's no more leaves on the trees. There's no more grass in the field. There's nothing left. So what little you had is completely gone and you are left with nothing. You have nothing to build a new home. Your home has been broken and scattered, ruined and destroyed, and cold winter is coming. You know, maybe if it was August, you'd be okay because August is warmer, but it's going to be cold and it's going to be bitter cold and it's going to be wet, as we're going to find out here in a minute. You, you saw the fields. You saw, the farmer says to the mouse, you noticed, you planned ahead. You knew what was happening. You saw that the fields were bare and wasted. You knew that winter was coming. And you planned, smart plan I might add, you planned to stay here beneath the blast of wind, the blast of rain. Until crash, my plow went right through your cell, your room, your home. So the farmer now got a better image. The farmer is standing here talking to this mouse because he's plowing his field. He's, you know, probably got this old fashioned plow, you know, the two handles with the blade down the middle, maybe a donkey or a horse at front. And he's, he's going through his field and he doesn't see it. He's just, you know, doing his work and, and this little mouse goes Eek! and scampers over. And the farmer looks and goes, Oh, what have I done? Oh no. Little mouse, you're scared of me, and I just destroyed your home, and I didn't see it, and I'm so sorry. And he looks at the little mouse, and he says, you, you built this house to protect yourself, and now you've got nothing left. So it is the farmer's fault, but it wasn't on purpose. Okay? His plow destroyed the little mouse's home. That small heap of leaves and stubble of grass 
has cost you many a weary nibble, nibble, little bite of food. You sacrificed. It cost you food to build your home. You could have been eating, but instead you were planning and building your home. You sacrificed to build your home and prepare. That's wise. That is smart. Sometimes we have to sacrifice now for the bigger game. And think about that. We do that all the time right? Especially if you, you play sports, you sacrifice now, you work hard, you play hard, you, you, your muscles are tired, you're sweaty, you're broken, and you're exhausted. But you do that so that when you go play the game, you will be stronger, faster, better, right? If you play the piano, you struggle now, your hands are tired, you've practiced for hours, but then come your performance, it's beautiful, right? We sacrifice now, for better things to come. And that's what the mouse did. It cost him many weary nibble, but, and we always pay attention to big buts, you are turned out for all of your trouble. You now have no house to protect you from the winter's sleety rain, frozen, wet rain, and the hoar frost. That's, we don't get a lot of this in SoCal, but that's like, uh, you know, when maybe you go out in the morning and your parents' car is just a little bit icy, that's a hoar frost. Okay. So, mouse, you built your home. You planned ahead. You sacrificed your food. You, you were prepared for the worst elements that you knew were coming. <sighs> but, mousy, you are not alone in proving foresight may be vain. Vain means for no good result. Foresight, being able to look ahead, planning ahead, sometimes planning into the future, it comes to absolutely nothing. You plan, you plan, you plan, and nothing good happens. You're planning for vacation, you're planning for vacation, and then your whole family gets sick and you don't go on vacation. Ah, all those plans for nothing. You do your homework, you plan ahead, you prepare, you study for the test, and the teacher goes, you know what? Yeah. No test. You guys are doing fine. Let's move on. You planned. You prepared for nothing. He says, Mouse, you're not alone. Saying that people look ahead and nothing happens. And then here, of course, we come to the big, big point. The best laid schemes of mice and men go often askew. Now, I asked you to pick up your books, your copies of of mice and men so you should immediately notice the title here in the poem and think wait a second that's the title of my book because that's the title of your book of mice and men so that's what we're talking about here and here's what the poet and rather the farmer is saying to the mouse he says the best plans that's what a scheme is the best plans of both mice because mouse you had a good plan you built your home, you prepared, you planned ahead for the winter, and now you got nothing. The best plans that mice make and the best plans that men make often go wrong. That's what a skew means. It means wrong. It means if you have a line, that's what a skew means. Or yet, after giggle, which is way more fun to say. Gang after giggle. It goes wrong. Your plans go wrong. The best laid schemes of mice and men often go wrong. So ladies and gentlemen, here's what he says to this mouse. He says, mouse, you made your plans. You, you, you thought ahead, you planned ahead. And then through no fault of your own, you did nothing wrong. Kind of just a freak accident destroyed everything. And he says, that happens to mice and it happens to men. We plan our lives, we prepare, and then freak accidents happen and destroy everything we have. They destroy all of our plans. Plans often go wrong. All right. The poem ends with this. Still, you are blessed compared with me. The present only touches you. But, oh, I backward cast my eye on prospects dreary and forward, though I cannot see. I guess, in fear. Essentially, what the farmer is saying is that mouse, you're still just a mouse, and your mouse's brain is, oh, about that big, and you don't have the capacity to think long-term into the future. And mouse, your brain is pretty small, and so you do not have the capacity to think long-term into 
the past. He says, but mouse, I not only have to think about the now, I have to think about the future. And I have to worry about the future and all the bad things that might happen in the future. And when I think backwards, when I cast my eye backwards on the past, I have to remember all of my troubles and all the bad things that happened to me. So here's what the farmer says to the mouse. Ultimately, he says to a mouse, I'm sorry I scared you. <clears throat> I'm sorry man and nature, man and animals can't live better together. He says, Mouse, I'm sorry I destroyed your, destroyed your home. You were smart. You planned ahead. You sacrificed for a better life. And yet, poof, it's gone now. Sometimes that happens to mankind. We plan. We work. We think ahead. And then freak accidents happen and rob everything from us. The best laid plans of mice and men often go wrong. All right. So John Steinbeck, this was written in 1785, this poem here. John Steinbeck wrote this in 1931, I believe. Uh, 1937, excuse me, 1937. Uh, and so John Steinbeck was clearly aware of this poem. In fact, he knew this poem so well that he took that line of mice and men and put it into his title. So very quickly. While there's technically a mouse in the book, it's not really about mice in the book. And yes, there are two men, and the story is about two men in this book. But the story is not about men and mice. All right? Um, and I'm not going to get too much into that right now, but just be aware that Steinbeck knew of this poem, and he picked these lines on purpose. So as we get started, ask yourself, why would he pick these lines? Why would he pick these words for his title? Kind of odd words to pick. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's probably going to do it for me for now for the poem. Just want to quickly remind you a couple things. Number one, when we looked at the poem, we did a little bit of poetry analysis. We looked at things like stanzas. We checked to see if there was a rhyme scheme. And then we studied each stanza individually. What does it say? What does it mean? And then we looked at the whole poem in a little bit broader sense. What's going on there? Okay. Plus, we had a little bit of fun. We slick at cow and timorous beastie. Oh, with the panics and the baristi. Then you know, start away so hasty. We become rattled. Right? And then, of course, we get the fun. Ging off to giggly. So, uh, I love starting with this poem to a mouse. I think it's fun. I think it's a good poem. It's kind of a fun introduction to Robert Burns, who's written lots of poems. You might enjoy reading his stuff. Plus, it's a great intro to the book we are going to read of Mice and Men, which I'm so excited. And I love reading of Mice and Men. You guys, I have probably, I read this, I think, three times on my own as a young man. I can remember reading it for the first time on my own when I was in high school. Uh, and then I have probably read this 30 times over my teaching career so far, maybe more. I love this book. I do not get tired of this book. Um, I hope you're going to love it too. So I should probably leave it there. I should probably quit while I'm ahead. So I think that I shall. So thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll catch you later. Bye.